Well, four satellite launches into the space race and the score in terms of pounds put into orbit is communism, 1,300, capitalism, 33. And the humiliations keep on coming. Playing it safe, America loses a chance to put the first man in space and instead opts to fly a steely-eyed missile chimp. The Russians knock a Grand Slam homer out of the park. Cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin does on the first manned mission in space, but it would take America three more launches to accomplish. In history's biggest sales pitch ever, the Soviet Union is handing the United States its ass on a platter. In part two of what we saw, we'll watch as America, America, continues its serial humiliation at the hands of a bunch of vodka-swilling savages, but then a new capsule, the space equivalent of a candy apple red 66 Corvette Stingray convertible, starts to dig in and get some real traction as the Cold War gets a little hotter. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. It was quiet in the LEM during those first hours on the moon. Back home, hundreds of millions of people just watched a textbook mission accomplish a faultless landing from a cartoon LEM, and everything looked rosy, so we decided to take a break for dinner and a chance to try and process the fact that the space race was actually over and we had actually won. You know, to us sitting in the Plaza Hotel overlooking Central Park in New York City, there's nothing shocking about being on the moon. We'd gotten below 50,000 feet from the surface. That's about a third again higher than your typical coast-to-coast -coast commercial airline flight on Apollo 10 back in May of 1969, just two months earlier. So it wasn't really the amazement of being on the moon so much as it was the realization we'd actually won the space race. Ten years earlier, the Soviets had made a laughing stock out of us as we saw at the end of part one. The Russians beat us into space, having orbited the first two satellites for a combined mass of 1,305 pounds, while the United States then orbited the next two for a combined mass of 33 pounds. Ten years earlier, the communists were ahead of us by a ratio of 40 to 1. And now that was over. We were on the moon. We'd used all of our missiles, our engineers, radars, computers, pilots, aircraft carriers, everything we had in the box to win a war with our ideological polar opposites. It couldn't be fought any other way on account of there being 20,000 hydrogen bombs on each side. We'd actually been at war with them for 15 years, and we won. Everybody on the planet knew what was going to happen next. In a few hours, the tension of the actual landing safely behind us and the details of how close we came to catastrophe was still packed safely away in the future. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were going to open a hatch in front of the closet-sized eagle. They were going to crawl out onto the porch and then slowly step down a golden ladder to claim our prize. You know, it never really occurred to me until just now, but during those first few hours after the landing and before the moonwalk, in many ways, the world of 2019 was born and the fate of the space age and everything that it could have been kind of was sealed. Because during that six hour intermission from history, the crew of Apollo 11's lunar module was conducting an operation that would remain hidden for many years to come. Aldrin was the specialist for this silent clandestine mission. It had been his idea and he was the one who'd gotten clearance to carry a small pouch containing items that were never officially recognized as part of the Apollo 11 manifest. Now, after all of the post-landing checks had been made and all the adrenaline in the two men had begun to clear, Aldrin opened a specially sealed package and began setting up as Armstrong watched him in stony silence. Armstrong didn't seem to like it much, and he must have been pretty worried about what was going on in terms of the political fallout if it ever became public. Aldrin tore open a pouch and poured some liquid into a metal cup. He later said that the edges of the fluid were curling up in very delicate sort of fashion in the slow motion of the one-sixth lunar gravity. 
I'd like to request a few moments of silence, he radioed back to Houston, opening the second package and spilling the contents into his other hand. Now, hours before the big show, he invited the Apollo team, but not the rest of the world, to join him as he proceeded. He said, I would like to invite each person listening in, wherever and whomever he may be, to contemplate for a moment the events of the past few hours and to give thanks in his own individual way. And with that, Edwin Eugene Aldrin Jr., elder at the Webster Presbyterian Church located on NASA Parkway back in Houston, Texas, quietly read a few words of scripture, raised the silver chalice to his lips, took a bite of a consecrated wafer, and had Holy Communion on the surface of another world. The first fluid ever poured on another planet was wine. Aldrin couldn't understand why this act had been swept so deeply under the rug. He said, at the time, I could think of no better way to acknowledge the Apollo 11 experience than by giving thanks to God. He would later write that in his memoirs. That would be 40 years later. But just six months prior to this moment, fellow astronauts Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders on Apollo 8 were about to enter their 10th and final orbit of the moon. It was Christmas Day, 1968. Now, the crew of Apollo 8 were the first humans to leave the gravity field of the Earth. Now, there was no intention of landing, of course. Apollo 8 went to the moon without a lunar module. But they did decelerate into lunar orbit, and so they became the first people in human history to see the Earth entire rising above the bleak and terrible lifelessness of the lunar horizon. As Apollo 8 emerged from the radio blackout caused by being, you know, behind the moon, Bill Anders made an announcement to the millions of us watching from Earth. For all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth. It was Christmas Day back home as Anders and then Lovell and finally Borman read from the book of Genesis. And they closed with this. Good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas. And God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Atheist activist Madeline Murray O'Hare had sued NASA over this intolerable insult. She lost the case, but in what I believe was the first example of an entire nation bowing to the shrieking rage of a handful of the politically correct, who it bears noting was also a lifelong open communist, a megalomaniac, a tax fraud, and enthusiastically despised by most everyone who worked with her. She lost the case. But NASA decided that it didn't want the trouble and made it clear to Buzz Aldrin that any religious beliefs he may have had, he needed to keep to himself. And there, right there during that six hours between the landing and the one small step, the fear of freely saying the things that we believed in was planted. Right there, the can-do spirit of the space age took a knee to political correctness. And there, in the six hours between having our cake and eating it too, we went from defeating communism to bowing to it. Now, what kind of man signs up for this sort of thing? Sitting on millions of pounds of high explosives, who volunteers for eight straight days in the center seat of an economy class at an airliner? What kind of man flies experimental airplanes at the upper edges of the performance envelope? Well, not to put too fine a point on it, but the answer is guys like me. And there were a lot of us back then. I wasn't just ready to go. I was going to go. Look, a lot of kids wanted to be astronauts during the space age, but I was different. I didn't want to be an astronaut. I knew at age five I was an astronaut and that the training and everything else were just details that I'd have to work out when I got older. A few years later, in the fall of 1972, I'd missed my bus home after school and was killing time until the next one came by. I stopped in a camera store, and there on the table, some exotic-looking thing with three wooden tripod legs tapering to spikes at the end. It was a flawless, open-ended white enamel tube and two flexible knobs radiating out from this strange-looking mount. I had no idea what it was. I'd looked through telescopes before, and this was nothing like that. There was no eyepiece at the back, nothing. So I kind of craned up and looked into the tube's jet black interior, and there, just a few feet away, was my reflection in a three-inch perfect mirror. And some kind of mount up at the front, the store owner took it off the tabletop, he set it on the floor, gave me an eyepiece, which 
not only got inserted at the wrong end, but which was also looking sideways and obviously a ridiculous arrangement. He pointed the tube across the bay. I looked through the eyepiece and that, my friends, was the end of that. It was, I later found out, something called a Newtonian reflector. It's a kind of a telescope that Isaac Newton discovered, in addition, of course, to the physical laws of orbits and equal and opposite reactions. He figured out that you could collect light with a mirror as effectively as you could with a lens. So, little Billy shot home. It was one of those blustery October days where it could get surprisingly chilly in Bermuda shorts and school-crested navy blue blazer and knee socks. The second my dad got home, I began negotiations in earnest. And I had shortly contracted with him a deal whereby I would work at the hotel after school and he would match every dollar I made to get to the mind-boggling price of $240 that it would take to get that telescope as a Christmas present. Two months from that moment. Two months. I bought a small cloth-bound paperback called A Field Guide to the Stars and Planets by Donald Menzel. Now, in one chapter, there were photographs of small sections of the night sky, and there on the opposite page was a negative image, black stars on a white background, with small Greek letters sprinkled about and descriptions below. It wasn't very long before I had all 88 constellations memorized. I wasn't trying to memorize them. I just never put the book down is all. Then there was the lunar chapter. You see the craters Tycho and Copernicus and Kepler look like white snowballs thrown hard against the moon by some kind of giant. And then below that, the smooth, dark lava flows from billions of years past, much smoother because they were newer than the battered highlands that had drowned the low-lying craters long before the dinosaurs appeared. Their names were amazing too. Oceanus Procellarum, the Ocean of Storms. The enormous circular ancient flooded craters named Mare Ibrium, the Sea of Showers, Mare Serenitatis, the Sea of Serenity, and Mare Crisium, the Sea of Crisis. And below those three round shapes, two more slightly ragged ones, Mare Fecunditatis, the Sea of Fertility, and to the left, Mare Tranquillitatis, the Sea of Tranquility. And we'll be right back after a message from our sponsor. And that sponsor is NetSuite. Look, you may or may not know this, but this program is recorded from deep inside the Rocky Mountains here at Apollo Backup Mission Control. Now, down here, we have our pretty simple financial needs, really. We have a monthly budget for Tang and space food sticks. There's a dry cleaning bill for the suit and formaldehyde drip for the host. But other than that, it's really pretty simple. However, if you run a real business in the real world, you probably realize that keeping track of your money is really the entire problem. And one of the problems is, is that you have all these different systems for keeping track of the money. Sales has their own system. Accounting has one. Inventory's got one. Too much time, too many resources, and that ends up hurting the bottom line. So listen to this thing about, uh, called NetSuite by Oracle. That's business management software. It's cloud-based, and it handles every aspect of your business, and it gives you the visibility to control the money that you need to be able to see in one place and control. With NetSuite, you save time, money, and a lot of unneeded headaches because sales, finance, accounting, orders, HR, all of that money is in one place. You can get to it from your desktop and you can get to it from your phone. That's why NetSuite is the world's number one cloud-based business system. And right now, NetSuite is offering you a valuable guide called Seven Key Strategies to Grow Your Profits. You can get that at netsuite.com slash Apollo. That's netsuite.com slash Apollo for your free guide, Seven Key Strategies to Grow Your Profits, netsuite.com slash Apollo. The book also had fuzzy, impossibly blurry black and white pictures of Mars and Jupiter with the belts and the red spot, I guess it was the gray spot, and the Galilean satellites, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. We know them as worlds now, but they were just little dots of light when I saw that book. Long before the telescope arrived, I knew all of it. And then on Christmas Eve, 1972, I opened the wooden box. I attached the legs and the tube, balancing them with the counterweight. And I put three eyepieces in the convenient little tray between the legs of the tripod. I delicately took the cap off of the small spotting scope and then the one covering the business end. And I set it down in the yard. Now, the first thing I did was I turned it on a star. It was an orange star. And I wanted to look at it first because it had a strange name. Betelgeuse was the correct pronunciation, but most people just called it Betelgeuse. Looking at a star through a telescope is exactly like looking at a star without a telescope, only more so. 
But then I walked it across the sky to a mid-bright, pale yellow point of light. I knew it was what I was looking for because sure enough, Donald Menzel was absolutely right. Planets don't twinkle the way that stars do. I lined it up, I put in the wide angle eyepiece, and I looked into the two. And there, off to the side, it's a very bright and very small golden BB with around it a white, white ring. The whole thing, including the rings, was probably about the size of my little fingernail. But by God, there it was, Saturn, as advertised. And that's when I realized that the unofficial motto of amateur astronomy is, you can have my telescope when you pry it from my cold, dead hands. Now, in 1973, my dad took a job that moved us from Bermuda to Miami. One day, we went on a field trip to the Miami Museum of Science and Space Transit Planetarium. It was early summer in Miami. Outside was a reactor of heat and steam, but inside the planetarium, there was a delicate pale white dome. It was lit by colored lights shining off of the star projector in the middle of the room and air conditioning. And I mean full-blown, no dicking around, all-American industrial strength air conditioning where on some mornings you could come to work and you could see your breath in front of you. So then the lights went down and the stars came on and the room flew through the solar system and I went back to school, I got home, I dropped my books, got back on a bus, went back to the planetarium, but it was closed. So I came back on Saturday. I said I wanted to work there, I'd do anything. Uh, they needed me to take tickets, show people to the seats, I'd clean up the vomit from the motion sickness, anything, I wasn't picky. The guy in the box office said thanks, but no thanks. They're on a shoestring budget the way museums always are, and they weren't hiring. I told them they didn't have to pay me. I took tickets and ushered people for four shows that afternoon. And when I was done, I told the guy in the box office that I'd be back the next day. He gave me one of those sure you will kid looks, but I did come back the next day and the next Saturday and Sunday as well. I volunteered for a couple of months until finally, I guess they just took pity on me and hired me at the fantastic rate of $2.15 an hour. I still have a photocopy of my first paycheck, $37.66, that was probably 100 hours worth of work, made payable to William Whittle from the Museum of Science and Space Transit Planetarium. Now, less than a year later, the writer for the planetarium, a flamboyant, brilliant lunatic named Jack Horkheimer, who PBS viewers may remember as Stargazer, well, he had a guest visiting and wanted to remount the slide projectors, pull out the old reel-to-reel -reel show dub, and perform by hand the show that was running when I had arrived. It was called Long Journey of a Young God. It was about the Apollo program. Just ended the year before. It was a masterpiece. Now, none of the console operators were available, but, you know, when opportunity comes knocking, you better have your bags packed. I said I could do the show. I'd never done a show before. There was something like 100 manual cues for dissolves, star motion, zooming planets in and out, and every single slide had to be manually advanced by hand. Jack didn't believe me, but I told him the truth. I'd been practicing that show before anyone came in in the morning, and I did it long after everyone left at night. I could do that show. This guy's important, young Mr. Whittle, he said. I said, I can do it, Jack. So he looked at me for a moment, then told me to rack up the slide trays. Turns out I made one mistake, and it was a minor one. The music swelled at the end of the show. I brought up the lights. Jack and his guest went out for drinks, and just as he passed the control console, he said, you start running shows tomorrow. I had just finished, from memory, an hour-long saga of the entire Apollo program. I was 14 years old, and now you know why I'm the one telling you this story. So when people ask me why someone would want to do something like that, endure all of that hardship, do all of the studying, take insane risks with your one and only life just to go up into space, I, honest to God, could not understand the question. Of course I'd go. Of course I would. I spent the 12 years between 5 and 17 training. Pretty simple plan, really. Air Force Academy, then shoot down communists at supersonic speeds for a while, then acceptance into the astronaut program, then command of the first Mars mission. Although I did admit to myself in private that I would be willing to settle for pilot if push came to shove. My best friends, Fritz and Steve, both Apollo kids, of course, the three of us would ride our bikes 20 miles to go to the Dade County Youth Fair. And we'd get on the wildest rides on the Midway, and then we would stare stone-faced for four minutes, concentrating on that orange Volkswagen in the parking lot, 
as our fixed point of reference. This wasn't fun, you see, this was serious business. I remember writing out a mission card after we came off of a ride called The Monster and we worked our way up into even scarier rides. And the card said something like, mission vehicle, the orbiter. You know, that's the ride with the graceful arcs of vomit flying off of it. Primary objective, maintain spatial awareness by keeping our eyes fixed on target VW. Secondary objective, overcome motion sickness through sheer teeth clenched willpower. So. In we go, the three of us just sitting three abreast, just like in the command module. Straps come on tight, hatch is closed and locked. Thumbs up to the carny, he wasn't watching. And come on, Jack, let's light this candle. We knew what we wanted. After having our butts handed to us by the Russians starting in 1957, as we saw in part one, the first American in space rocketed aloft a full two and a half months before the Soviets. A one-man Mercury capsule thundered and roared atop Werner von Braun's Redstone missile, essentially an elongated A4. The date was January 31st, 1961, and on that glorious day, the United States of America sent 98% of the human gene pool into, by God, outer space. Purists, however, continue to insist on splitting hairs about this, so I suppose that in the interest of accuracy, I should mention, parenthetically, not the first American in space was a chimpanzee named Ham. A carefully trained chimpanzee named Ham is carried to the same survival capsule that will lift America's first Mercury astronaut into space. After a daring childhood escape from French Cameroon in 1957, Ham joined the United States Air Force two years later in 1959. Unlike the godless, dog-murdering red bastards scheming behind their Kremlin walls, we Americans look after our own. Ham went straight up, coasted for a few minutes, and then came straight back down again. That's what's called a suborbital flight. That means you get into space all right, you get to see the curvature of the Earth, you get a little bit of zero G, but it's a much, much easier mission than a full orbital flight, which means you have to go fast enough so that you're perpetually moving and falling over the horizon. Now, while up in zero G, Ham pushed buttons and moved levers just a fraction of a second more slowly than he'd done it on Earth, his heart rate was far slower, calmer, and more regular than yours would have been. Then the full resources of the richest and most powerful nation on the earth were mobilized, and 16 minutes and 39 seconds after liftoff, Ham's capsule splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean, where he was picked up by USS Donner. On the way up, his Mercury capsule had suffered a partial pressure loss, but since he was an American, he was wearing his custom-made silver Mylar suit, don't leave home without it, he bruised his nose a bit when he hit the water, but otherwise this steely-eyed missile chimp came back to a hero's welcome. By the way, after retiring from NASA, Ham worked in Washington at the National Zoo for several years before moving to his space-age bachelor chimp pad with a group of other chimps. Ham died in 1983, having lived to see 12 of his close friends and relatives walk on the moon. And he was buried with military honors at the International Space Hall of Fame in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Now, Ham's flight was exactly the same, pretty much to the letter, as the one that Alan B. Shepard would make a few months later in his capsule called Freedom 7 on May 5th, 1961. But between Ham and Freedom 7, an unknown Soviet test pilot went from utter obscurity to being the most famous man in the world. And it only took one hour and 48 minutes in space for him to do it. He was Yuri Gagarin, the astronaut the Russians lionized as the first to orbit the Earth. It was the propaganda coup of the year. It was April 12, 1961, when Yuri Gagarin boarded Vostok 1 and lifted off, not from glamorous sunny Cape Canaveral, but out in the middle of nowhere, the Baikonur Cosmodrome located in southern Kazakhstan. And this was not some sort of nickel and dime toe in the water suborbital flight either. This was the whole enchilada, one complete orbit of the Earth before re-entering the atmosphere and then ejecting from his capsule at about 23,000 feet as planned. Gagarin had blacked out. He was taking eight Gs on the way down. And the scorched steel sphere of Vostok 1 landed in the Saratov Oblast, made a hole, bounced a few times, finally came to rest. Gagarin landed by parachute just a few minutes later. He was greeted by a peasant farmer and his daughter, and he was still in his spacesuit, had his helmet on, he was carrying his parachute. The two locals backed away in fear. They'd never seen a space monster before. 
Grinning, Gagarin raised his visor and said, don't be afraid. I am a Soviet citizen like you who has just descended from space and I must find a telephone to call Moscow. You know, America would have two iconic heroes of the space age. The Soviets had Gagarin. Both of our guys rolled into one. He was everything a national hero should be. Brave, modest, handsome, and intelligent. Gagarin looked like him. Yuri Gagarin looked exactly like the kind of man who was going to be the first man in space. He was perhaps a little bit looser than his American counterparts. Here's what he said as he cleared the pad on his way to outer space and immortality. That's Russian for let's roll. Now, in a pre-selection evaluation report by a Soviet physician, Gagarin was described with uncanny resemblance to an Ohio-born Marine who would soon follow in his footsteps, not to mention a young test pilot also from Ohio who would join NASA the year after Gagarin landed. The space race produced scores of astronauts and cosmonauts. They were brave, intelligent, and driven men, and one woman, every single one of them. But Gagarin and the two Americans from Ohio, whose time was coming, had something beyond the right stuff. All three of them were almost mythological incarnations of the countries that they represented. So listen to this segment of the physician's pre-selection report on Yuri Gagarin. It's interesting because it's virtually interchangeable with the descriptions of John Glenn and Neil Armstrong. Modest, embarrassed when humor gets a little bit too racy, high degree of intellectual development, fantastic memory, quick reactions, persevering, prepares himself painstakingly for his activities and training exercises, does not feel constrained when he has to defend his point of view if he considers himself right. On March 27th of 1968, Gagarin was killed on a routine training flight along with flight instructor Vladimir Seryogin when their twin-seat MiG-15 UTI spun into the ground near Kurzak. Now, the official investigation blamed a negligent ground crew for leaving external wing tanks attached and a negligent air traffic controller for issuing out-of-date weather information. But Gagarin's friend, astronaut Alexei Leonov, the first man to walk in space, said he heard two explosions that day. He believes that a supersonic Su-15 flying way below its assigned altitude came to within 10 or 20 meters of Gagarin's plane, and the shock wave sent Gagarin into an unrecoverable spin. Leonov maintains that the first crash he heard was a sonic boom from the Su-15, and the second was Gagarin and Suryogin's MiG hitting the ground. Yuri Gagarin was 34 years old, and he's buried in the Kremlin walls. So, whipped again. The Soviets had orbited a cosmonaut, while America's finest, the Mercury 7, sat on their thumbs and watched. Kind of killed the buzz, if you really want to know. So, what was going on with Team America? Well, we had gathered 110 of the best military test pilots in the nation, and this at a time when we were breaking speed and altitude records nearly every week out at Edwards Air Force Base in California's Mojave Desert. The candidates were split into three groups who were then shaken, spun, probed, monitored, isolated, everything short of dissected. The seven men who made the cut had met all of the requirements, less than 40 years old, less than five foot 11, excellent physical condition, at least a bachelor's degree and a qualified jet test pilot with at least 1,500 hours of flying time. Unveiled to the nation as the answer to these repeated Soviet successes, this group called the Mercury 7 became household names, although some names would be a little more household than others. They were Scott Carpenter, Gordon Cooper, John Glenn, Gus Grissom, Wally Schirra, Alan Shepard, and Deke Slate. Only one of those men would walk on the moon, and that would be more than 10 years later. Now, Shepard was the tallest at 5'11". There's a photo of him aboard Freedom 7 just before they closed the hatch on his Mercury capsule. He looks like a man who's caught in a vending machine, like he's trapped between the glass and the candy bars. A Grissom, at only 5'7", had a much easier time of it. Gordo Cooper was the youngest. He was 32. Glenn was the oldest at 37. But there were other bonds. All were male. All were white, although John Whitehead, the first black American to graduate from the Air Force Experimental Test Pilot School, was in the running, but he didn't make the finals. But there's more. All of them were either the eldest or the only sons. I was the eldest in my family, by the way. All of them were from small town America. All were married, 
all had children, and all of them were Protestant Christians. And all of them were very, very smart. Their IQs ranged from 135 to 147. They were the pride of the country. And by the way, if you haven't seen the movie of their story called The Right Stuff, watch it. It really captures the souls of these seven men and the country that they represented. They were going to take and keep the lead in the space race. And then a little more than three weeks before Alan Shepard followed Ham, you know, Astro Chimp 65, on a suborbital flight to become the first man in space, the Soviets blew the whole thing open again with Gagarin's orbital flight. So Alan Shepard went from being the first man in space to becoming the first American in space. Shepard would survive his flight, he'd become a national hero, and he'd get his revenge about a decade later. I gotta tell you, I love the Mercury program. Those silver spacesuits and those badass helmets made the Mercury 7 the coolest looking dudes ever to walk the Earth, the Moon, or anywhere else, ever, before or since. The Mercury capsule is small enough to fit in the back of a pickup truck, but it's really good looking with its black corrugated nickel alloy skin. And one of my favorite things about Project Mercury was the fact that the astronauts themselves got to name their own capsules, but with one convention. Shepard was first, the mission name was MR3 for Mercury Redstone 3, but his ship was named Freedom 7. Now, a little more than two months after the flight of Freedom 7, star-crossed astronaut Gus Grissom flew Liberty Bell 7 on MR4, another suborbital flight, on July 21st, 1961. Both Shepard and Grissom splashed down far out into the Atlantic. Now, Freedom 7 was recovered normally, but as Liberty Bell 7 was bobbing in the waves, Grissom reported hearing a dull thud. It was the explosive bolts on his hatch. It blew off into the ocean and the capsule began to flood with seawater. Now, as recovery divers attached the helicopter's cable to the capsule, Grissom found himself flailing around, the rotor wash from the hovering chopper blasting him in the face. With his helmet off, his suit began to rapidly fill with seawater, and he was treading water furiously as he watched the helicopter struggle to lift the waterlogged capsule out of the Atlantic. But it was sinking like an anvil. The helicopter pilot decided to cut the cable and his losses, and he released Liberty Bell 7 before it took the helicopter with it 16,000 feet down to the floor of the Atlantic. Parenthetically, after several attempts, that capsule was located and raised 38 years later, back in daylight again on July 20th, 1999, the 30th anniversary of Apollo 11's landing on the moon. Now, for the rest of his brief life, Grissom maintained that he had not accidentally triggered the bolt that sank his Liberty Bell 7. The right stuff all but says that that was precisely what he did. He panicked, he was tearing at his helmet, and he blew the bolts. But his fellow members of this exclusive fraternity defended Gus vehemently, so much so that three Mercury missions later, with Wally Shiraz's Sigma-7 safely aboard the deck of the recovery ship, Shiraz got back into the capsule and intentionally fired the explosive bolts. You see, manually triggering the hatch resulted in a unique injury to the astronaut's hands. Shiraz, who just manually blew the hatch, emerged with this injury, but Gus Grissom didn't have it. The consensus now is that the external release lanyard held in place by a single screw had come loose and fired the bolts accidentally. Whatever the cause, explosive bolts had nearly cost Grissom his life in the water. A few years later, the lack of explosive bolts would cost him his life in a fire. Next was the icon. John Glenn would ride the new Atlas booster not into a single orbit, but rather seven complete circles of the Earth to regain the lead. And yet again, those hopes were shattered before the flight even occurred when cosmonaut German Titov beat Glenn, NASA, and the United States to the punch once again, completing 17 orbits, that's a full day, aboard Vostok 2. Now, the Mercury program really does come in two different flavors. The first two flights, Mercury Redstone 3 and 4, were just up and down suborbital flights, lasting about 15 minutes or so. But then came the Atlas. Sleek, silver, muscular, I think the Atlas rocket with the Mercury capsule was the most beautiful launch system ever made. The suborbital redstone booster looked like a cigarette sitting next to it. The bottom of the Mercury capsule was actually wider than the top of the redstone, but on top of the Atlas. It tapered to aesthetic precision. It was a far, far more powerful ride. In fact, about the only thing you can say bad about the Atlas was that it tended to explode a lot. 
This may have been due to the fact that that sleek silver skin of the ICBM was about as thick as a dime. MA6, that'd be Mercury Atlas 6, lifted off from Cape Canaveral on February 20th, 1962. John Glenn, first of the two iconic Ohio boys, had been from the very beginning everyone's favorite. He's courteous, friendly, well-spoken, with pale blue eyes, a winning smile, and a crew cut. John Herschel Glenn Jr. was early 60s America made flesh. Glenn had shot down three MiG-15s over Korea. He was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross six times and the Air Medal 18 times. In 1957, Glenn became the first man to go from one end of the country to the other faster than the speed of sound. Marine Airman Major John Glenn begins an attempt at a supersonic transcontinental flight. His Crusader jet camera plane leaves Los Alamitos, California, headed nonstop for New York. Average speed was nearly 727 miles an hour. Now, now I was too young to remember John Glenn's flight being only three years old on February 20th, 1962, but the Mercury capsule G.I. Joe set did come with a flexible plastic record, and if you put that on the spindle and lowered the needle, you would hear John Glenn's voice as he cleared the pad. Roger, the clock is operating. We're underway. Godspeed, John Glenn. And then with those utterly unique, gorgeous vernier rockets firing off to either side, the Atlas packed the punch to send Friendship 7 high enough and fast enough, not for the planned seven orbits, but for well over 100. Once safely in orbit, Glenn took manual control of the spacecraft, yawing it in the direction of flight. Now, we tend to think that his picture of the Earth was kind of blurry and grainy and black and white, but John Glenn saw the Earth in all its glory, his perfect eyesight giving him a 4K, 3D, 120 frames per second view of the Earth scrolling below. As he passed into the night, he looked down to see the lights of Perth, Australia, brilliantly lit below. The residents of Perth had turned on every light they had to welcome Friendship 7 to Oz. But as Glenn began his second orbit, ground controller Don Arabian noticed that a sensor on board Friendship 7, known as Segment 51, was starting to get a little squirrely. If the sensor reading was correct, the retro rocket pack and the critical heat shield had somehow come loose. Now, by the beginning of the third orbit, Glenn jokingly asked that the Marine Corps Commandant be advised that he just passed the four hour mark, the monthly minimum for Marine Corps active duty pilots. He said it made him eligible for regular flight pay, but it wasn't a regular flight, not even by Project Mercury standards. If the Segment 51 sensor was reading accurately, then the heat shield at the bottom of the capsule was loose and America's hero, would disintegrate with his capsule as it re-entered the atmosphere at 17,544 miles per hour. Glenn had been advised about this problem during his previous orbit. The early Soviet flights, while undoubtedly impressive, were virtually completely automated. There was very little that a cosmonaut could do. Glenn, on the other hand, had used up so much of his thruster fuel, turning around and reorienting his capsule and just generally sightseeing that mission control finally had to order him, well, actually advise may be a better word, to stop playing around, conserve thruster fuel, and just let the capsule drift. Yeah, we can on Roger. The capsule is turning around. Now the retro rockets needed to slow the capsule out of orbit were strange, stocky affairs. A pair of three short, fat rockets attached to the bottom of the capsule by three steel bands. Now, during a normal re-entry, that retro pack and the bands that held it on were to be jettisoned after the retro burn, but that incessant Segment 51 warning light kept flashing. If the heat shield were loose, perhaps the steel bands holding the retros in place could keep it in place. Worth a try. Glenn manually fired the retro rockets on a cue from Capcom. Maneuvering fuel was down to 15%. As he fell into thicker air, he watched what might have been the most dramatic re-entry in the history of man's spaceflight. Not only did he see the white-hot plume of plasma as Friendship 7 ripped the air to pieces? He also watched as the retro pack disintegrated into a trail of flaming globules. Our condition is good, but that was a real fireball, boy. One of the steel straps holding that retro package in place broke loose and was glowing bright orange just a few inches outside of his window before it finally tore loose and disappeared with the rest of the debris. If the heat shield were to fail, Glenn would have a second or two, certainly no more than that, to realize what had happened before he and Friendship 7 turned into ionized vapor 40 miles above the surface of the Earth. 
Turns out that Segment 51 had been drinking on the job that day. The heat shield had been solidly in place the entire time. Colonel John H. Glenn, Jr., the return of a conquering hero. Alan Shepard had been beaten by Garin at the last second, but he'd get another chance. John Glenn would get another chance, too. In 1998, as a longtime sitting senator from the great state of Ohio, Glenn rode the space shuttle Discovery into space as part of her six-man, one-woman crew. Cheated out of four orbits by a faulty sensor, John H. Glenn Jr. would pick up 134 of them during the nine-day mission. At age 77, Glenn was the oldest person ever to fly in space. Clean Marine was the only one of the Mercury 7 to fly in the space shuttle, and he ended up outliving all of them, dying on December 8th, 2016, at the age of 95. There was a third Mercury astronaut who would also live to get a second chance. Following the flight of Friendship 7, Scott Carpenter would pilot his Aurora 7 through three orbits, followed by Wally Schirra for six orbits and Sigma 7. And finally, Gordo Cooper blew the record away when his capsule, Faith 7, completed 22 orbits to end the Mercury program. But wait a second, that doesn't add up. Seven Mercury astronauts, but only six Mercury flights. Well, it turns out the man scheduled to fly the second orbital flight immediately following John Glenn was named Deke Slayton, who named his capsule Delta-7. Neither Deke Slayton nor Delta-7 ever left the pad. Not long before his flight, Slayton had developed an atrial fibrillation. It's an abnormal heart rhythm. In what looked to be the most heartbreaking disappointment of the American space program, Deke Slayton was grounded. But rather than retire, he gave everything he had to the program. He became the senior manager of the astronaut office. Slayton would oversee the recruitment of the next wave of astronauts, and he pretty much alone determined which astronauts would crew what missions. Deke Slayton would never get to fly his Delta VII capsule, but after 13 years of irreplaceable service, Mercury 7 astronaut Donald Kent Slayton would ride the very last Apollo into space on July 15, 1975, beating all of his companions with 148 circuits of the good Earth. Back at Tranquility Base, Apollo 11 astronauts Armstrong and Aldrin were originally slated to wait not six hours for the moonwalk, but 12. Now, these are the least emotional, most highly disciplined humans ever to come out of the factory, but even they have their limits. For reasons that will forever remain shrouded in the mists of history, these two men, alive after a perilous landing and just a few feet outside the window, lay the culmination of everything that they'd worked so hard for, risked their lives for, with all of humanity resting on their shoulders and their entire nation glued to the TV sets for some reason or another, they were just not in a sleepy mood. Oh, and another thing, sleeping in the Lem was not exactly the Four Seasons. The best way to picture this is to imagine the lavatory on a commercial jetliner. You have two restrooms opposite each other separated by an aisle. Now, imagine taking the aisle away between the two so that the two restroom doors touch each other. That's the size of the limb. Then you have to add spacesuits, helmets, other assorted gear. Then imagine two grown men finding a way to lie down in that space the size of two airplane bathrooms. There were no curtains on the triangular windows of the Eagle, NASA scientists having concluded that the potential threat from peeping toms was deemed manageable enough. But if you could climb up the ladder on the now exhausted descent stage, stand on the flat deck called the porch, cup your eyes against the glare and look inside, here's what you'd see. Just inside the left window would be a head. The limb was too narrow side to side for a person to lie flat, so the figure in front would be in a crude hammock and his feet would be sloping diagonally downward toward the right. Directly over his midsection, you'd see a pair of boots, toes pointing upward. That's about all you'd see, because the other guy was stretched out feet first, front to back. I've never seen a picture of the astronaut sleeping in the limb, and you haven't either. For the simple reason that there was no one else available to take the picture in the first place. But I can tell you that from looking at the diagrams, the inside of the eagle looked like nothing so much as a small morgue. Armstrong and Aldrin would spend a little over 21 hours on the moon, about two hours and 15 minutes of which consisted of the actual moonwalk. And so, with the main event moved up six hours, they began to wrestle with the packs, gloves, and helmets stowed away in every available corner of their twin airline lavatory. Now, two men suiting up on the moon is a long, long way 
from a chimp being blasted into space in a tiny capsule. As we'll see in part three, the Apollo program flew several unmanned and four manned missions before Apollo 11, each one taking another tentative step closer to Tranquility Base. We'll look at the details of those missions as well as the entire flight of Apollo 11 in part three. But to somehow get from one man in a spam can to the intricate choreography of orbital rendezvous, docking, navigation, landing, and all the rest, that leaves a pretty big hole. And that hole was filled by the least famous part of the space race, Project Gemini. The Gemini flights had only one purpose and one only. It was to learn how to rendezvous and dock in space. Now, without that skill, you wouldn't be able to pull the folded legged lunar module out of the Saturn V third stage. If you can't rendezvous and dock reliably, then there's no reason to have a lunar lander because you can't get into it. The hardware problem wasn't too tough. This is going to be a lot more complex, so we're going to need two astronauts instead of one. Sitting side by side, these Gemini twins would each have a decent sized window and two clamshell hatches, each one opening outward, just like Doc Brown's DeLorean in Back to the Future. Now, of course, a heavier capsule was going to need a bigger booster out with the gorgeous Atlas rocket and in with the pedestrian looking Titan II. Remarkable in one way only, namely the fact that it produced no smoke whatsoever on the way up. Ignition and a perfect liftoff. After splashdown, bobbing merrily in the water, the Jiminy capsule is very hard to distinguish from the Mercury capsule. Almost exactly the same shape, twin hatches and a little bit larger. But in orbit, it was almost twice that size. In orbit, it had a tapered nose cone forward of the actual pressure capsule, which contained the parachute and the rendezvous radar needed to track whatever the hell it was you were going to dock with. And then came the actual capsule with the twin astronauts. And behind that was a ring of reaction control thrusters. And behind that were coolant pumps, drinking water, extra fuel, instrumentation, more thrusters, and some coolant pumps. If the Mercury capsule was a Mini Cooper, and the three-man Apollo capsule was a small SUV, then the Jiminy spacecraft was a candy apple red 1966 Corvette Stingray. Mercury had rudimentary control thrusters, and Apollo was heavy and sluggish. But the Gemini, well, that was a pilot spacecraft. It had joysticks that gave it six degrees of freedom simply by determining what thrusters were being fired at any given time. If you use one set of thrusters against the other, you would get yaw left and right pitch up and down, and roll clockwise and counterclockwise. Use them in unison, and you could strafe left and right, up and down, and forward and backward. It was built to be maneuverable, and it was more maneuverable even than the Apollo capsule and far beyond anything the Soviets had tried up until that point. Mercury proved that man could survive in space. Jiminy's job was to teach him how to actually fly up there. Now, of course, with two men per mission, NASA was going to need more astronauts. Having already met the Mercury 7, the nation was now introduced to NASA Astronaut Group 2, popularly known as the New Nine. Neil Armstrong was part of this group. Three of these new Jiminy astronauts would go on to walk on the moon. Two of them would make the journey to the moon twice. And another two, each as likely as Armstrong to have been the first man on the moon, would die in the attempt. Gemini number one lifted smoothly off the pad. It rose high above Cape Kennedy, following the programmed flight trajectory for orbit. Both Gemini 1 in April of 64 and Gemini 2 in January of 65 were unmanned flights to test the capsule and booster systems. But then in March of 1965, Gemini 3 just barely went out of the driveway. Three orbits only, back home, no drama. Gus Grissom was the command pilot. He nicknamed the Jiminy 3 capsule the unsinkable Molly Brown in memory of a famous survivor of the Titanic and his own Liberty Bell 7, both of which were thousands of feet deep on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. His co-pilot was John Young, the only man to fly the Gemini, Apollo, and space shuttle vehicles. Then came Gemini 4, commanded by James McDivitt with pilot Ed White. It was much more ambitious. Those spacious doors of the Gemini capsule were designed with spacewalks in mind, but once again, the Soviet Union beat America to the punch when Alexei Leonov became the first human to float free of their spacecraft, in this case, the two-man Voskhod 2. It was an extraordinary sensation. 
I had never felt quite like it before. Another first for the Russians. Something was different this time. The Vostok was a complete lemon. Basically, it was just a stripped-down, one-man Vostok, identical to the one used successfully by Gagarin and five other Vostok flights. By removing the ejection seat, the Russians could just barely squeeze two men into a one-man capsule. However, when Leonov began his 12-minute spacewalk, he had to exit the vehicle through an external inflatable airlock. Vostok 2 had to remain pressurized during the spacewalk because it was powered by vacuum tubes. The Soviet avionics would fry without an atmosphere of air pressure to carry away the tremendous heat that the tubes produced. And also, Vostok could not carry enough air into space to be able to refill the entire capsule. And so the plan was for Leonov to return to the pressurized capsule, close the outer door on the inflatable airlock, then squeeze in besides crewman Pavel Balayev, close the hatch, and jettison the airlock. Like I said, this mission was different, and it was the first time that safety was sacrificed in order to get the first. Now, upon returning to the airlock, Leonov forgot his training, he had other things on his mind, I guess, and he entered head first. Now, that meant that he couldn't close the outer hatch, which was behind him, so he tried to turn around while inside the airlock. But during this time, Leonov's suit had overinflated to the degree that he was stuck in the inflatable tube and unable to either enter or leave. Leonov's core body temperature rapidly shot three degrees up in 20 minutes. He nearly passed out from heat stroke. Once he returned to Earth and gravity, Leonov discovered that he was literally up to his knees in his own sweat, which had been sloshing around as he had struggled to free himself. Now, finally, he risked a case of the bends by bleeding air out of his suit, decompressing the human-shaped balloon just enough to wriggle inside. Turns out, he wasn't going to need the suicide pill that he carried in the event that he could not re-enter the capsule, leaving Belyaev no choice but to abandon him in space and return to Earth on his own. So the accolades once again flowed into the Soviet space program. Leonov had beaten Ed White by almost three months. But the Gemini capsule was a far, far better vehicle than the Soviet one. The brand new solid state electronics tolerated a vacuum just fine. And the huge service ring in the back of the spacecraft easily carried enough oxygen to refill the entire capsule. Although there were some problems with the latching mechanisms on the doors, when it finally opened, Ed White had all the room in the world. He simply pushed off and flew out into the void. This is astronaut Edward White as he stepped from the Gemini 4 craft into space. Where Leonov was squirming and sweating and fighting for his life, the problem that NASA encountered with Ed White was that he simply didn't want to come back inside. He made excuses about needing to take more pictures. They were heading towards darkness when Gus Grissom in Capcom said to McDivitt, Gemini 4, get back in. So McDivitt switched over to White's frequency and he relayed the message, uh, they want you to come back in now. Drifting gently back into his couch, it was dark when they finally closed the hatch. Ed White later said that returning to Gemini 4 was the saddest moment of my life. Gemini 5 followed in August. It was time for an endurance mission. Now, Mercury astronaut Gordon Cooper and New 9 recruit Pete Conrad spent a week in space, 120 orbits. Still behind at the quarter mile, the American space program was finally starting to dig in and get some traction. Now, they needed something to dock with. The top stage of an Agena rocket fit the bill pretty well, but when the Agena target for Gemini 6 failed to reach orbit, NASA, gaining confidence fast now, basically said, F it. if Gemini 6 can't rendezvous, then we'll have them rendezvous with Gemini 7. Gemini 7, with new nine astronauts Frank Borman and Jim Lovell, actually launched 10 days ahead of Gemini 6, now renamed Gemini 6A. Mercury astronaut Wally Schirra, who'd blown the explosive bolts on Sigma 7, back to make the point for his friend Gus Grissom, sat next to new nine rookie Tom Stafford. Okay, go ahead with your memory compare. Roger. A few feet in front of them, out the window, as if they were looking into a huge, perfect mirror, they saw the smiling faces of Borman and Lovell in Gemini 7. They'd not only rendezvoused, they'd cut a rug with each other. Shira went on to say, I was amazed at my ability to maneuver. I did a fly-around inspection of Gemini 7, literally flying rings around it, and I could move to within inches of it in perfect confidence. That's what it would take to get to the moon. 
that and one other thing. They would find that missing piece on Gemini 8, March 16th, 1966. Two new nine rookies again, pilot Dave Scott and a commander by the name of Neil Armstrong. Armstrong and Scott flawlessly flew the Gemini capsule through a series of changes in orbit, modified the apogee, which is the highest point, the perigee, which is the lowest point, and also changed the orbital inclination with ease. Up in the nose section, Gemini 8's radar showed a target at 179 nautical miles. The Agena docking target was in orbit and ready. On a slightly lower orbit, Gemini was moving slightly faster than the Agena target vehicle. At 76 nautical miles, they thought they could see it out the window. We are looking at the target docking adapter end of the Agena. The command pilot makes a docking approach by applying very small thrust increases to Gemini 8. Okay, Gemini 8, uh, we have TM solid. You're looking good on the ground. Go ahead and dock. Armstrong slowly brought his spacecraft to within 150 feet. There was no relative motion at all. It was a perfect rendezvous. At three inches per second, Armstrong guided the nose of Gemini 8 into the docking adapter. Latches clicked, a green light came on, and they had just completed the first docking of two spacecraft, a skill absolutely necessary to the Apollo program missions and the prime objective of the entire Gemini program. Flight, we are docked. Flight, we are docked, radioed an ecstatic Dave Scott. Yeah, it's really a smoothie. Now, once docked, the Agena began an automated procedure to turn the two docked vehicles 90 degrees to the right. As they yawed sideways, Scott noticed that they'd begun to roll as well. Armstrong used Gemini's maneuvering thrusters to stop the roll, but once he'd made the correction, it immediately restarted. Although they first suspected a problem with the Agena, Armstrong noticed that Gemini 8's maneuvering fuel had dropped to 30%, indicating a problem with their own capsule. Now still docked with a massive rocket, with a lot of fuel sloshing around on the inside, Armstrong and Scott decided to undock from the Agena to work the problem. Scott released the docking mechanism, and Armstrong fired a long burst on the forward thrusters to push Gemini 8 well clear of the Agena. Once the extra mass of the Agena left the equation, Gemini 8 entered what was certain to be a fatal roll rate of almost 300 degrees per second. That's one full rotation every single second. few minutes more and centrifugal force would cause them to lose consciousness and after losing consciousness they would die with the sun and the earth just a blurry kaleidoscope outside neil armstrong slowly and methodically began to shut down the maneuvering thrusters built for rendezvous and activate the re-entry control thrusters which was an entirely different system this was the moment that we were ready to go for the moon Dave Scott, his fellow crewman on the flight, would later walk on the moon in command of Apollo 15, was one of the greatest test pilots of all time. Here's what he said after Armstrong's courage, knowledge, and otherworldly calm got the capsule under control and back home safe after NASA's first emergency landing. The guy was brilliant, Scott said, obviously still in awe of his new nine colleague. He knew the system so well, he found the solution, he activated the solution under extreme circumstances it was my lucky day to be flying with him. Rookie Neil Armstrong on his first ever space mission saved the capsule, saved the mission, saved his and Scott's lives, and saved the program. Now, Gemini 9, 10, 11, and 12 were still to come. More records would be set, more docking experience gained. A few of the Mercury veterans and a number of the new Gemini astronauts would fly out the remainder of Project Gemini and then begin the step by methodical step of the Apollo program. Many Gemini pilots had several more flights in them, but Neil Armstrong was not among them. Neil had just one mission left to fly. Now coming up in what we saw part three. Hey, I got an idea. Let's go to the moon. Great. All we need is a really big honking rocket, but that rocket is too big, too complex, and too expensive to have ever been built, NASA has to go with the smaller, simpler, and lighter little Saturn V. Meanwhile, there's a fire in the cockpit 
Apollo's first flight ends in mutiny when the crew refuses to eat their peas. Political correctness is born in response to a Christmas greeting from lunar orbit. Rusty can't find a bucket after rocketing up the Garn scale. And Snoopy and Charlie Brown go for the moon in Operation Blue Balls. All of this and a whole lot more really cool, really weird swinging space age history coming up in part three of What We Saw. Apollo 11, What We Saw, is written and presented by Bill Whittle, produced by Robert Sterling, directed by Jonathan Hay, executive producer Jeremy Boring, our supervising producer is Mathis Glover, and our technical producer is Austin Stevens, post-production producer Alex Zingaro, story producer Jared Sitchell, edited by Paul Matthew Gordon and Gajai, audio recorded by Mike Coromina, audio mixed by Patrick Joyner and Mike Coromina, Graphics by Cole Holloway and Anthony Gonzalez Clark. Design by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistants Ryan Love, Sam Thompson, and Mason Dodson. Apollo 11 What We Saw is an Esoteric Radio Theater production. Copyright Esoteric Radio Theater 2019.